follow the new American Media dot com on Twitter at American underscore Media underscore. We are back with Zach Barris, NBA scout, lifelong Cleveland sports fan. Zach and I have been discussing today all things NBA from the draft to the playoffs. And, you know, something else we were talking about were, you know, kind of decisions of franchises. You said you just really couldn't wrap your ma- mind around what the Knicks were doing, going out and, and bringing Carmelo and putting him putting him with Amari Stoudemire, what, what the Nets were doing trying to make a couple of their trades. Let's talk about Cleveland and how they're rebuilding because, obviously, w- we've talked about it on this program before that, that we were just completely shell-shocked. It set us back at least one full year before we could even begin the process of rebuilding because we didn't know about the quote-unquote decision until the very last minute. And let's talk about the rebuilding process of the Cavs because Dan Gilbert is an owner. He's taken a few shots, but you and I tend to be in agreement that he's one of the best owners in all of sports. So let, let's kind of just toss it all out there and pick it up where you feel like. Okay, so the Cleveland Cavaliers, basically, I think they're trying to build a model after the Oklahoma City Thunder. You know, there's no reason to sign a bunch of free agents now to try to win now when you're not going to win a championship anyways. You know, that's how they're looking at it now. You know, why get stuck in the late lottery or picking around 15 or 16 for the next couple of years where you're not going to be able to draft an impact player? Try to build slowly and, and just build the best team possible. That, that's what you need to do at this point. You know, and then in a couple of years, once you have those pieces that you've drafted, then you can go out there and then you can start signing free agents when you feel it's best and necessary for your team. Right now, it's best to stay in the lottery for a couple of years, be able to draft cheap, young talent, and then have all that cap space in a few years to go out and be able to sign free agents. You know, I think that's the biggest part of it. You know, a lot of people go, oh, 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 let's win now. Let's go out and sign. Let's go out and sign this player. Let's go out and sign that player. You know, like sometimes you just have to take it slow. You just have to take it slowly. And, you know, that gives you, a long, that gives you a better formula for winning in the long run. You know, it's either you have the choice right now where the Cavaliers can go out and sign a couple free agents this year and be the eighth, you know, and be where anywhere from the fifth to eighth seed for the next six or seven years. Or we can go out there, build this thing, you know, for a long-term solution, you know, and wait three years before they're an elite team again, and then suddenly go out there and start being the number one or two seed in the East again, you know, and pounding teams away. You know, you have that choice, you know. You know, I'm not saying, you know, the Cavaliers might in two years, you know, like I said, you know, like I said, is LeBron will hit free agency again in two years. I'm not saying he's going to come back, but I'm saying I, I can't see him going anywhere else if he is Miami other than to Brooklyn or Cleveland. And I, I just don't know if he could handle New York. I think it all depends on what happens this series with the Heat and what happens the next two years. You know, if he goes and reels up three straight championships, there's no way he's leaving Miami. If he goes and wins one this year and loses two after – I see him leaving because he realizes, you know, he goes, I was able to win one there. You know, it, it was a semi-failure, but also it was semi-success, too, because we were able to win one. I, I think that's based a lot off of what the Cavaliers may do in the next couple of years, too, because if a free agent like LeBron becomes available, you just can't see the Cavaliers passing on a game-changer no matter what he's done in the city. You know, if a game-changer like that becomes available. You know, he is a franchise player. No matter what anybody says, if you pair him up with Kyrie Irving, you know, and either a Brad Beal or a Michael Kidd Gilchrist in a couple of years, that team would be off the charts. I mean, it'd be so good defensively. You know, it, it would just have so... I mean, and that would be LeBron's first time ever playing with, you know, a stud point guard, which he's never had in his career. You know, which is always, would always be nice to see him play it's with It's crazy when you, when you bring it up that way that, that he's ne- LeBron has never played with a stud point guard. Mo Williams was a little out of character. Booby was all right, but he was more of the backup. You know, Baron Booby was more of a shooting guard. Met. Mo Williams was a shooting guard. You know, the, the best pure point guard... And when I mean pure point guard that LeBron has played with his entire career, it, it's almost funny to look at. Has been you know basically Jeff McGinnis. Jeez. You know when, when I'm talking about pure point guard, you know the Cavaliers always had you know Delonte West was more of a combo guard, and well they always called LeBron you know, you know, a point that, forward. They always always called him a point forward because he well, liked he has, playing I mean, point guard. Just imagine if he had someone else facilitating his offense, so like a guy like Kyrie Irving, you know. I mean, I would love to watch something like that someday. I think it'd be fantastic to watch. I think it'd be really fun. All those back I cuts think, to I, the to the rim, you know, kind of faking out a defender, knowing yeah, that you I mean, have another a lot of quarterback throwing I mean, you it. don't see LeBron with a ton of alley oops in, in Miami because they don't have a point guard. You know, Wade throws as many as he can. But if it's not as many, you know, if you had a guy like Irving or Chris Paul playing alongside of him, you know, it'd be completely different. It really would. Um, so you have to look in that scenario, too. Is I, I think, I think that... You know, a lot depends on the Cavs. I think they're going to wait a couple of years before signing free agency. There's just no rush. 
you know, in, in the next two years, you have no shot at beating Oklahoma City anyways. Who's only going to get better? Their team is so young. You have no shot at beating them within the next two years anyways. Just hold off and wait and see what you can do in the future. You, you know, there's no rush right now to get back in it. There's none whatsoever. You know, yes, the fans want to see them back, but the NBA, it takes patience in order to build a team. It's like baseball. You know, when your prospects are coming along, you can't just go and trade your prospects for a mediocre player. You watch teams do that all the time, and they go out and lose star players. I mean, you have to just watch for patient teams like the Washington Nationals, who have drafted really well over the past couple of years. And it's just like, you know, you can't just go and keep trading your prospects every time for a big league star. You know, you have to be able to save some money. You have to be able to go in there and have a couple losing seasons. It happens. You know, you can't. Miami, Miami Heat are one of the few teams in the league that was able to build a team overnight. <laughs> build a team or hijack the city of Toronto and Cleveland in the same night. Yes, I guess it's all in the vernacular. But, yeah, I mean, you talk about building through the draft and, and – we, we're talking about elite point guards. You and I have had this conversation before. You, you, you are fairly convinced that it's not just highly possible. You would say maybe even likely that at some point LeBron returns to the Cavs. But you, you mentioned something earlier that we haven't discussed on the air yet about another really talented point guard that may actually return to his former team. I wanted to address that real quick. Um, I'm going to address this real quick, too. Uh, Chris Paul obviously left New Orleans. He wanted to trade out of New Orleans. He still loved the city. You know, felt bad about it, but the thing is, they didn't have an owner, they weren't spending money in free agency, they had lost David West to the Indiana Pacers, uh, and they weren't competing, and I think Chris Paul saw the situation as just, it was a bad situation to be in, and he has to be traded, he was very calm about it, though, you know, you know, he, he wasn't talking to the media about it, you know, it, it was a private thing, he got traded to the Clippers, I think he was very happy, but, you know, I, I think Vinny Del Negro went on the cheap again by, you know, keeping Del, I, I mean, Donald Sterling went on, the, went on the cheap end again by signing Vinny Del Negro to an extension, rather than going after a coach that could be perfect for their system, like a Mike D'Antoni, um, you know, in, in L.A. You know, it should be a perfect system, running down system with Blake Griffin. It would Griffin be flashy. And, uh, it would be flashy. Yeah, that, that's actually yeah, and, a decent and, idea. And Neil, well, and Neil Olsey, too. I, I mean, he got rid of his general manager after basically correcting the whole thing. You know, goes out there and acquires Chris Paul to a, a, you know, a franchise who's just been dead for, you know, basically said dormant for 30 years. Right. For 40 years, you know, under Donald Sterling, you know, they've won one playoff series until this year. You know, and what, they go and win, they go and win one, you know, against Vancouver. It was a great series. You know, fans actually were showing up to watch the Clippers this year. You know, granted, tickets were still very cheap, but, they, you know, fans were showing up this year, which is surprising. I mean, you never see that with Clippers. The arena's always, you know, it rarely is it half full at a Clippers game, you know. And... You know, Donald Sterling does it once again. And Chris Paul now looks at the situation in New Orleans, I, I would have to say, like, you know, I either think, I, I kind of don't think he's leaving L.A. for the most part because the Lakers don't have anyone under the, they don't have anyone under contract for 2013 yet. So you can see Chris Paul go leave and go to the Lakers and go play with Kobe Bryant. I think that's a strong possibility. Oh, man. Because the guy just bought an $8 million house in Bel Air. You know, and you don't, you don't just buy a house for $8 million and live in it for two years. Uh, you know, you rent in that situation. So I think he's fairly company staying, but... You have to look at the scenario now with New Orleans that opened up because New Orleans suddenly now has an owner in Tom Benson who everyone hated in that city, you know, five years ago during Hurricane Katrina. You know, he was, I mean, everyone hated him. You know, he tried to move the team to San Antonio. You know, now everyone loves him in the Saints. They renovated the Superdome. You know, now he owns the New Orleans Hornets. They suddenly have the number one overall pick in the draft in Anthony Davis. They have Eric Gordon, Al Farouk Amino. They, they have some talent around them now. And, you know, if you go out and get a star point guard like Chris Paul, they're still going to have the other tap room, too. And, you know, they could turn that, – that team could turn into, you know, a powerhouse overnight if they were to bring Chris Paul back. I think that's a scenario, too, where you have to look at is Chris Paul can go, I'm a free agent in a year. You know, maybe I'll go back to New Orleans. You know, we can put a winner on the floor there. That's you know, I know he was happy. That he was really sad to leave New Orleans. I haven't heard a lot of that chatter going on, but I mean, it's 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 that time of year where you got to think about where your team is moving forward for the next decade, uh, with with the talent you draft, the the moves that you make, and you know, it, I was wondering what your professional opinion is. We're talking with with Zach Barris, lifelong Cleveland sports fan and NBA scout. If 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 we could get your opinion real quick on how you would grade Danny Ferry, how you would grade Chris Grant, and how you would grade. 
Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cavs. So talk about the former Cavs GM, the current GM, and then the owner. Because you're used to grading the talent on the floor, but obviously you can't do any of that or put together any teams without the GMs and the owners being on the same page with the checkbooks and the scouting. So what would you say with with Ferry and Grant and uh, Gilbert? I'm going to give I'm going to give Danny Ferry a B minus uh, because, like I said, I mean, yeah, he only had so much to work with, you know, and he had to make quick moves in order to basically appease LeBron. Uh, he did that, you know, I, I mean, I think some of his moves were questionable. Obviously, he had some bad moves, but he had some good moves, too, at the same time. I'd give him a B-. minus. Uh, you know, the Delonte trade, you know, where we brought him in, you know, and Joe Smith, all those guys in from Chicago and Seattle, and getting rid of Larry Hughes, I think, was a good one. But the Larry Hughes signing was terrible to begin with. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm giving him as low as I did. Uh, Chris Grant, I would probably give an A to, maybe even an A-plus for what he's done. You know, he didn't. He wasn't listening to everyone. You know, take Kemba Walker and Derek Williams last year. You know, went and took the safe picking Kyrie Irving. You know, he got your star point card. They selected a guy based on his potential with Tristan Thompson, whose game needs a lot of work, who I think has the potential to be a very good player someday. He's not going to be a superstar, but has that Marcus Candy-esque potential, which I think is very solid, especially getting him in last year's draft, which was kind of depleted of talent. Uh, I, I really, you know, it's not his fault he didn't resign LeBron James, but I think he's done all he could so far. You know, it's not like he's had many misses as the Cavaliers' general manager. So I'm going to give him an A. Uh, Dan Gilbert is an owner. I'm going to give him an A-. minus. Uh, you know, he renovated the arena. You know, apparently they have some more plans in the near future that he hasn't discussed yet, but, you know, to do a, you know, a complete makeover at the arena in a few years from what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, he, he spent all the money that he could. You know, I think he really tried to please LeBron when he was here, and I think that might be his only downfall, that he gave in too much to LeBron. You know, is, is that he basically just wanted to have LeBron have everything, and I think that's you know if we do that, we're going to be able to keep the guy, and then obviously it didn't work. So that's why I'll give him an A minus instead of an A or an A plus. And so as we wrap this up here in, in just the last couple of minutes, the, the future for the Cavs, how do you see it playing out, and the future for the NBA with with either David Stern being a part of it or their reach globally. I know that these are all broad topics, but try to wrap it up in about two minutes here. All right, well, I think the future for the Cavaliers is very strong. They have a ton of draft picks over the next few years and tons and tons of cap room. Uh, as long as they spend that money right in free agency and they draft properly, they'll be heading back to, we'll be heading back to the, you know, the playoffs in, you know, in a couple of years. I mean, it could conceivably be there next year, but I would say it more likely is, is a decent team within a couple of years, two to three years. Uh, looking at the, um, I think the NBA altogether, the NBA, you would think in a lockout year like in 98, when, you know, is it an all-time low in popularity? There wasn't a true superstar than Shaquille O'Neal in the league at the time. You know, no one really seemed to care, uh, especially that, that championship, you know, when, when the San Antonio Spurs won, you know, no one seemed to care about the NBA. This year, in a lockout short season, everybody thought the NBA was in a struggle. It's been the exact opposite. Its popularity is an all-time high. I believe game one was the second most-watched finals game of all time. And I think I think the popularity for the NBA is only going to keep going up as long as you have young superstars that are going to keep coming to the league and that are setting the watch. Well, you know what? We have a very interesting finals. You got the three-time scoring leader and the two-time MVP. It is making good television. I'll tell you what, I'll be able to take a nice exhale, a nice deep breath as soon as the Heat lose. That's always my favorite time of the year for the past two years, unfortunately, as a Cleveland Cavs fan. So... You know, we'll see how it plays out from here. So, Zach, why don't you wrap it up for everyone? Say uh, where they can find you after this. And, you know, you, you tend to be a part of our program on most Fridays anymore covering the NBA. So let them know where they can find you. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Z-B-A-R-I-S. Uh, I look forward to, you know, everyone following me. It's always great. And uh, I just want to thank you again for having me on the show. I always appreciate it, and I love being on. Sure thing. Well, thank you very much. We will do this again real soon. This was Zach Barris, lifelong Cleveland sports fan and NBA scout. He has been a part of our program for quite a few weeks in a row now. And if you hear in the background, we have some music. We're, we're taking submissions, by the way. If, if you have some original content, it's got to be all original content, and you got to be happy with us playing it in the background and putting it into our radio broadcast and putting it up on YouTube. This is Tatiana Moroz song is Revolution, and it's a good chance to make the transition from the Unhappy Hour Sports Show. Just listening to a little bit there.
bit of a little campaign slogan, a little bit of a political bent. But yeah, I mean, we make this hard to pivot, you know, plant the pivot foot and go in a different direction every Friday from sports into politics. So if you're into sports, thank you for joining us. And, you know, maybe if you if you have the stomach for it, if you, if you feel like having some elevated conversation focused on liberty and just making sure that you get to live your life the way that you choose, as long as you're not bothering other people, that's why we have our Agree to Disagree show. So I'm just going to shut up. We're going to play it, let the last of the song play itself out. Then we're going to hit reset and begin Agree to Disagree here on the newamericamedia.com. Revolution, wake up and start to pay attention. Cause we've got the solution, the Ron Paul revolution. 